Hi everyone. So as John said, this is recommended draft policy, Aaron 2019-1, clarify section four IPv4 request requirements. Next slide, please. Uh, myself and Amy Potter are the advisory council shepherds. Uh, this started out as a proposal last year, January 2019, was moved to draft policy the following month. Uh, after the meeting in April, it was moved to recommend, or after the meeting in April, it was is moved to recommended in July of 2019. It was reverted back to draft because there was discussion in the meeting in Austin that we wanted to add some merger and acquisition language. So we moved it back to draft so we could make the necessary changes within section eight um, and then moved it back to recommended status just last month. Um, after a few staff and legal reviews. Uh, this was presented twice um, last year, Aaron 43 and Aaron 44, and the latest version was May 18th, 2020. Next slide. So staff and legal review, summary, staff understanding. Aaron 2019-1 would restrict organizations that are involved in 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4 transfers from applying for IPv4 addresses from the Aaron waitlist for specific time periods. Specifically, it adds 36 month restriction for source organizations and 90 day restrictions for 8.3 and 8.4 recipient organizations. Additionally, it specifies that 8.3, 8.4 recipient organizations and 8.4, 8.3, source organizations will have any current Aaron waitlist request removed. Next slide. Staff comments. The text is clear and understandable and can be implemented as written. All previous staff suggestions have been accounted for. Next slide. Legal assessment, the policy as written creates no material legal issues. Resource impact, minimal, could be implemented within three months. The following would be needed in order to implement staff training, updated guidelines and internal procedures, standard documentation updates. Next slide. And now for the AC presentation. Next slide. So there were two policy goals. Um, these haven't changed since the beginning. Um, it's to clarify the waiting period to only prohibit requests for IPv4 allocations under section four of the NRPM, um, and to also disallow organizations that have transferred space to other parties within the past 36 months from applying for additional IPv4 space under section four. Next slide. So this is the current language. Uh, this actually hasn't changed since the last meeting. Um, there were some discussions during the last meeting uh, that there needed to maybe be some language changes for, um, or not language changes, but additions to uh, the 8.2, 8.3 and 8.4 sections. So when people were looking up the merger and acquisition language you didn't have to jump around the NRPM to try to figure out um, where the relevant, relevant information was. So I'm not gonna read this, but I will read the next slide if I can get the next slide. So the proposed new language for section four, again, this really hasn't changed much. Um, multiple requests are not allowed. An organization currently on the wait list must wait 90 days after receiving a distribution from the wait list or IPv4 number resources as a recipient of any transfer before applying for additional space. Aaron at his sole discretion may waive this requirement if the requester can document a change in circumstances since their last request that could not have been reasonably foreseen at the time of the original request and which now justifies additional space. Qualified requesters will also be advised of the availability of the transfer mechanism in section 8.3 as an alternative mechanism to obtain IPv4 addresses. Restrictions apply for entities who have conducted recent resource transfers. These restrictions are specified in section eight for each relevant transfer category. That last sentence was added so that people would know to go to section eight. Next slide. So these are the, <laughs> these are the, the, the extra text that was added to 8.2 and 
So the proposed new language for those sections um, add the following under 8.2 mergers and acquisitions and reorganizations. An organization which serves as the source of an 8.2 IPv4 transfer will not be allowed to apply for IPv4 address space under section 4.1.8 Aaron waitlist for a period of 36 months following said transfer unless the recipient organization remains a subsidiary parent company or under common ownership with the source organization. So that covers section 8.2. 8.3, add the following under 8.3 transfers between re specified recipients within the Aaron region and under the conditions on the source of the transfer. The source entity, no, excuse me, the source entity will not be allowed to apply for IPv4 address space under section 4.1.8 Aaron waitlist for a period of 36 months following the transfer of IPv4 address resources to another party. Under conditions on the recipient, if applicable, the recipient will be removed from the Aaron waitlist and will not be allowed to reapply under section 4.1.8 Aaron waitlist for a period of 90 days. Next slide. Okay, so um, these were the, the additions to 8.4 and 8.6 um, for further clarity. Uh, so add the following under 8.4 transfers between specified recipients within the Aaron region and under the conditions on the source of the transfer. The source entity will not be allowed to apply for IPv4 addresses or address space under section 4.1.8 Aaron waitlist for a period of 36 months following the transfer of IPv4 address resources to another party. Under the conditions on the recipient, if applicable, the recipient will be removed from the Aaron waitlist and will not be allowed to reapply under section 4.1.8 Aaron waitlist for a period of 90 days. So there was also some discussion that the, how do we fit in the, the waitlist restrictions? Um, and there really wasn't a section for waitlist restrictions. So um, we ended up suggesting and, and submitted to PPML and everyone seemed to be on board with this to add section 8.6, which would actually be waitlist restrictions. Any organization which is on the waitlist and submits a request to be the source of a transfer under any provision in section eight will be removed from the waitlist. We also added this section. So if there were any other waitlist restrictions, they could just be built into this section and it kind of could just get taken care of inside this policy. Next slide. So points of interest, this proposal incorporates two related policy goals, uh, which were stated in the beginning. Um, I think during the very first Aaron meeting that this was presented at, it was um, uh, approved by the community that, that it was a good idea to incorporate the goals. Uh, there have been updates to section four since the beginning of this work, um, but we have updated the, the policy to come in line with all of those changes since the changes were made. There was significant community support to change the word repeated in the text um, as it was vague. And additionally, there was concern that a company may perform an M&A transfer to itself parent company and the or original proposed language would exclude those companies from being able to apply to the wait list. So that was during the last meeting in Austin. Um, we didn't want people to get confused with um, what happens with the M&A transfers and, and how do we handle that. So that right here, this section is why we moved it back to draft policy to rework the language, make sure that the AC wanted to move it back to recommended. There was just too much to, too many other sections that were being touched. We didn't want it to stay recommended without really going over it. Um, and then before the last staff and legal review, the draft policy did not include the removal of pending Aaron waitlist request for organizations that act as a source organization for 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4 transfers. And that was remedied, like I stated in the previous slide, with section 8.6. So that covered that. And the most recent staff and legal that I presented in the beginning 
is the, the resulting staff and legal after all of this had gone through. Um, reception on PPML has actually been excellent. So um, next slide. So thank you. And um, that is all I have for 2019-1. If anybody has any questions or discussions. Thank you, uh, um, Kat. So the way this works, uh, which is slightly different than uh, our in-person meeting is that we'll be going to the Q&A first uh, that has been typed in and then we will be looking for raised hands. So I believe we have our first Q&A that came in literally just as Kat finished. So Beverly, who will be helping me throughout the next two days. Sure. Looks, uh, we have a, a statement from Owen DeLong. I support this policy as written. It closes some unintended loopholes in previous language. These additional restrictions on the wait list should help reduce its attractiveness as a target for fraud. Uh, thank you, Owen, for your comment. And just as a reminder, though, and I know there's no place for it in the Q&A to just put your affiliation. Um, I know we won't have our traditional that way, so. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, that's the only q and I think we have now. Do we have any raised hands, Beverly? At the moment, we have no raised hands. If anyone else would like to raise their hand to speak, they can. We'll give the virtual queue about 20 seconds. And then, uh, yes, thank you, Owen, for uh, affiliation, Aaron AC, just for the record. Um, uh, we'll give about 20 seconds, and then if there's no comments. Uh, we have an additional typed comment from Kevin Bloomberg at The Wire, and support is written. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, if you wish to speak on this proposal or comment on this proposal for the Aaron consideration, AC consideration, please now start typing QA uh, or raise your hand so that you can be a uh, thing. I think we have a raised hand. Okay, we do have a raised hand. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to unmute. Um, actually, I'm going to jump over real quick and let you know that uh, we do have a typed answer that uh, Joe Provo from Google, Aaron AC, uh, support as written. Thank you. Okay, let's and try it. Let's try the historic first uh, interactive uh, response. So great, uh, Marce, I am going to allow you to talk. You should be able to speak now. State your name and affiliation and your comment, please. Hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. We can hear you. Oh, very good. Wonderful, I had typed it. The question is whether there is any history on the number of instances where this policy has occurred or would have impacted prior to the policy change. I'm gonna send it. Uh, so I think if I heard it correctly, you're asking how many times uh, the, this, uh, this policy, the issue that the policy experience report flag has uh, occurred. Um, I don't know John Kern or John Sweeting if we have that data available handily. I'll turn it over to either. John, you are muted. Could, could you repeat that? Nope. This is John. Um, so it's hard for us to know. We can't, we don't track how a policy would have been implemented before it's implemented. So we don't know whether people uh, would have, how many people would have been deterred uh, if this had already been adopted. Uh, does that answer your question? I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. Is it Merce Mercea? You're, mu you're muted if you are still there. Okay, um, we'll uh, move on. Let's go back to the Q&A. Okay, at this point, uh, I have a statement from Adam Thompson at Merlin. I'm satisfied that there has been enough oversight during this process. I'm okay with the proposal as written. So we'll take that as support, thank you. And from Celeste Anderson, uh, from Pacific Wave, I support as, as written. Okay, thank you for that support. Is there anyone who would like to speak uh, on this, specifically who might be opposed to it, who would like to give some feedback to the AC? Yeah, Paul, this is John Sweeney. I, I just wanna say there's no, we don't have numbers for that, but it was enough of, a, of an issue that staff felt it needed to be raised up as, a, as an issue for the AC to look at. And if they felt it needed to be fixed and it should be fixed. Thank you. Uh, we'll give another 15 seconds here just to allow uh, people typing because unfortunately we can't see whether you're typing a question and that, at that point we will close uh, the queue. Oh, we have one additional. 
I'm going to butcher names today. <laughs> Ross Trevor of Atlantic uh, Metro. Am I reading the policy correctly that organizations are removed from the wait list upon requesting a transfer, even if the transfer is not approved? Pat, do you want to address that for us? I actually would need to look at that, believe it or not. Um, Sure, while you're looking at that, I'll just uh, take a cue here. There was a question about that there was no affiliation. Uh, Mercy, again, Mercia, it was Mercia Arnold that gave the audio comment uh, for the person that asked. Um, Mercia, if you could just type your affiliation to Q&A, we'd appreciate it just for the record. Well, while we're giving Kat a, a chance to look up on that, we'll come back to uh, that question uh, from Ro Ross. So why don't we take uh, Chris Woodfield's comment uh, uh, Chris Woodfield from Aaron AC, Twitter, uh, original author of this proposal, happy with the extensive edits and support as written. Okay. Uh, Owen, can we unmute Owen DeLong if uh, possible? He would like to comment on the Absolutely. Owen, on Ross's question. Hand? Yeah, sure, Owen, no could problem. you raise your hand, please? That makes it a little easier for us. There you go, Owen, go ahead. Owen, you have your own control now. So um, not to steal Kat's thunder, but as I read the proposed policy, the, um, the, the person requesting a transfer out would be removed from the wait list upon request of the transfer out, uh, regardless of whether the transfer out was successful or not. Because if you are offering to supply IPv4 addresses in a transfer, it is somewhat indicative that you have addresses you don't need. And so it doesn't make a lot of sense that you would be remaining on the wait list needing additional addresses. Okay. Yep. Kat, did you want to add anything to that? Sorry, Kat and John. Kat, did you want to add anything? I don't know why I'm pointing down like she's there. But... Yeah, I, I, I agree. Okay. John Kern wants to add something. I, I agree as well, and, and we'll confirm the policy text. Uh, is implemented that way. If it turns out it's otherwise, we'll bring it back to this group. Uh, just as a point of order, thank you, uh, Marcia. I'm sorry again if I'm, uh, Marcia Arnold is uh, with TOG, Vice President of Risk Management. Uh, thank you for your interaction and, and welcome. Um, I believe we've now answered all our Q&A. Uh, is there anyone else with their hands up? Uh, please just bear with us as we kind of get used to this, since we can't see at this people point, it appears that we are cleared. Um, okay. I will give 10 more up. seconds. If we see nothing in 10, we will close and go to our poll. Hearing none, going last, going last. Seeing none, we are closing the uh, queue. We thank uh, Kat for her presentation. Um, at this point, we are going to try our first poll. So typically, if we were in, in person, we would sh do a show of raise of hands of, for those uh, who are either in support or against. And as this is a recommended draft policy, um, we've always held a poll for that. So this time we're going to uh, attempt to make use of Zoom's poll functionality. So in a few seconds, a poll will hopefully pop up on your screen. Uh, Sorry, can we are... clarify, can you state the number um, of the policy we're looking at just to make sure I'm launching the correct poll? 2019-1, yes. Thank you very much. So the question is, uh, are you in favor or against, yes or no, of this policy advancing. And this feedback is used by the advisory council to make its determination on whether or not to forward it to the board uh, for approval. So if there's no further input, we're going to try this and ask you all to on the question. So the question is on Aaron 2019-1, clarify section four IPv4 request requirements. I'd ask you to answer on the poll. We will open the, keep the poll open for 30 seconds to allow you to answer. I'll give a few more seconds. Yeah, I'll just give it the 30 just to be sure. We might tighten this up in future polls, but since it's our first, we'll... Uh... Andrew Dull is asking for the bad jokes and the music I've told staff I would keep my jokes to a minimum. I can't accommodate that if necessary. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me sing. Okay, last chance, last call. Please answer the poll. Let's close the poll, please, now. And in a few seconds, Beverly, I'd ask you to give us the results of the poll, indicating how many people are present at the meeting right now and how many people are in favor or against. 
Yes, at the close of this poll, there were 108 attendees, um, 56 voted in favor and one voted against. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a very great participation rate. So uh, that feedback will be provided to the advisory council for their consideration. And with that, I'll turn it back to John to introduce our next presenter.